Welcome to Voices for Impact, the podcast. Started during the COVID-19 pandemic and made in Syracuse, Voices for Impact is full of conversations with thought leaders from around the world that have made significant accomplishments in their lives and have gone through their own challenges, but have made it through those adversities and made positive impacts through their work. I'm your host, Danielle Mensing, and as a fundraiser for a nonprofit, I believe the most valuable tool you can give yourself is making a positive impact on others and your community. Every conversation is going to give you tools and tactics from entrepreneurs, athletes, artists, and change makers that will encourage you to develop a growth mindset and reimagine how you can find your purpose. Now let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Voices for Impact. My name is Danielle Mensing, founder of Voices for Impact. And today I am chatting with David Haas. He is the executive director of Sarah's Guest House and the owner and creator of the popular Instagram account, Syracuse History, which focuses on unlocking the mysteries of and invoking pride in the city of Syracuse. He is also the leader of the Syracuse chapter of the National Stuttering Association, a board member for the historic Oakwood Cemetery Preservation Society Association, one of the facilitators for the Eastwood sector of tomorrow's neighborhoods today, TNT, and a member of the Onondaga County Democratic Committee. He is also a resident of Eastwood in the city of Syracuse. Thank you so much for having a conversation with me today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. This will be interesting. Yes. So let's begin with Syracuse history. How did Syracuse history start? Where did this idea come for you to start taking images and videos and posting them online? And how did that account grow? Uh, yeah, just give us some insight into that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of evolved over time, for sure. Uh, the account first started now in 2013. Um, I got an iPhone in 2012 and I started just going out and taking pictures of things that I like and a lot of things that I like have to do with the homes here, the buildings here, history here. So I started to just document that on my personal Instagram account. I would be out walking and I would take a picture of a building downtown yeah. and I'd be like, oh, how old is this building? So I would go and I would like look it up and then I would post that on my own personal page. And two people that I actually went to college with commented like, we absolutely love this. This is like so cool. And so I started to think like, hmm, maybe I should start a page that just is about these homes and the buildings and the history of them in our community. Um, and so, it started like that. And if you go back to my original post, the first couple hundred, um, you see they all start and end the same way. Pictured is with the address, then it has the historical information, and then it ends with um, where the person who's attached to that building is buried. Typically here, it's in Oakwood, which is where my love for Oakwood Cemetery comes from. Um, but over time, it has evolved into getting into the buildings, getting into the houses, um, doing more community-oriented projects, I would say. Yeah. Um, speaking up more for the untold stories for the people who don't have a voice. Um, so it kind of started as a storytelling effort and pictures um, to more of let's try to make some changes here. And another one of the reasons why I started the page too, as it evolved and started to get more popular was I think there was like a gap in what I was doing. Um, obviously, you know, like the newspaper 
industry um, has taken a lot of hits over the years and has to has had to cut um, staff and their focus all the time isn't just on what's happening locally. And so there's stories that are going untold. And I started to pick up on that when I when I started to tell stories and um, there was a gap there. Um, the human interest stories from the older days of an, inter of an individual like Sean Kirst, who isn't with the post standard anymore, um, was just getting left out. So I kind of took that up as like, when I have the chance, I will try to tell those stories. Uh, this is not my full-time job. It's actually not a job at all. It's just a hobby of mine. I do it um, when I have downtime, which is not that often, but uh, it's entertaining. Um, I love it. I love what I do. So it's never looked at as like, oh, this is time consuming or um, this is hard uh, because I, I enjoy what I do. And it's a way that I can give back to the community. Yeah. Um, I love keeping up with, I mean, every post you have is always interesting. I have to look into it and read what it's all about. And when there's several pictures, I'm looking at every single one. It's just so intriguing, the history behind these buildings and homes. Um, how did you, and I think as this account has grown, you've gotten even more access into these abandoned homes or buildings that people aren't able to visit. So how do you get access to tour these um, places? <laughs> do you have uh, secret connections or? Um, hmm. I won't tell all my secrets in this interview, but I will say it's exactly what you said. It's a lot of connection. So when I do get into one building, it typically leads to another building because one person knows another person who knows another person. And I think as the account has gotten popular, a lot of people respect my content and they know when I'm given permission to tell their story or document a building that I do it the right way and in a consistent way. And so they trust me with their building, with their house, with their story. And that kind of just has evolved over time and opens up more doors. Um, on this page, I have met hundreds and hundreds of people um, uh, who give me the opportunity to showcase different things in our city. So a lot of it is just building those connections yeah. as, as you said. So um, I know you've posted some homes that the Syracuse Land Bank is looking for somebody to purchase. Have you had um, heard any results from um, someone purchasing a building as a result from seeing your post or anything like that? Yeah, I do hear that often. Um, it's not always I picture or I bought that exact house, yeah. but even um, I'll give you an example. I was, our, I was out looking at yard sales mm -hmm. um, two weekends ago, and uh, I ran into a friend of mine who introduced me to her friend, and she told me that she had just moved back here in the past year from Washington, D.C., and she said she only moved back here because of my page. She said it gave her a different glimpse into this city, and she wanted to be a part of what's going on here, yeah. um, and she, because of the pandemic, is now working from home, mm -hmm. so she told me that there's now an option that I can work from home and live back where I want to live now that I have a better understanding of our community because of your page. Wow. And so I hear that um, often and that just is humbling um, to a large extent as to what kind of impact um, my page can have, my 
words can have. Um, and to go back to uh, what you said about like starting the page and whatnot, like I'm a person who's, who stutters and I'm extremely active in the stuttering community as well. I'm the chapter leader for the Syracuse chapter of the National Stuttering Association. And so I'm not always the best with words and public speaking, um, though I actually do it often and I've given a TED talk and a bunch of other things, but the page also allows me to tell a story um, in a medium that's easy for me to access in terms of, I don't have to worry about how something's coming across. I can just type it out and I know it's gonna be perfect because there has been times when I've been asked to give tours or um, walk with uh, students from SU to showcase the community to them, um, which I have done and I have accepted those kind of things, but it's always just a little bit more challenging for me. Um, and I hesitate at times to do those kind of things, but um, that page is kind of like an ounce of freedom for me because I don't have to use my words. <laughs> yeah, um, and I love that. I think that's really, sh for those that are listening that may know of somebody who stutters or may stutter themselves is very inspirational to hear from you of the ways that you and the mediums that you use to um, be creative and tell stories. Um, and I think also going back to your story about the woman who moved to D from DC to here, and it was yeah. your page. I think that's something that we've, um, as a Syracuse community have really talked about, but no one has really, um, put forward uh, a movement that has made an impact in that way that has really showcased Syracuse to the outside community of this is the um, amazing things that are here in Syracuse this is why you should move back or move here um, and I think more and more people are seeing that especially um, post pandemic or we're kind of still in the middle of the pandemic but you know um, those yeah. that to big cities and are sick of working to live and want to move um, back to uh, beautiful upstate New York and Syracuse where they can still have their jobs remotely but live in a, in a better environment. Yeah, totally. And I think upstate as a whole always gets this bad breath as to who we are and what we do here. And especially if you only go on Facebook and you see the comments sections um they're horrible they're just absolutely nasty the worst of the worst comes out of people there and so if you hear a story and it's posted on facebook and you go to the comments um you're like why would i ever go there to even walk to eat to shop to live but the instagram it's but the instagram account changes your perspective towards it and kind of prolips the script. And that has been one of my goals over the past couple of years to change how people think and see things. Um, even when I started the page, I wanted to really focus on houses um, on streets that are um, looked at as not the safest place to go or there's more poverty there any of those kinds of things that people may think like why would you go there um but to change and say no look at um the buildings here the people here there is value here um and to shine a light on what is often overlooked and at times it's those people um i haven't done this yet but I wanted to do a story in in where I take the comment section off of a post from Facebook and go to the streets and talk to the people that they're talking about and have them read the comments back to the authors of those comments 
to show the human element about who you are talking about. Like these are actual people that you bring down with your words when we should be trying to actually lift people up. I totally agree. I think that's a great idea. And I'd love to see that when you when you do do that project, because I think that does put a human connection to it. And uh, so much, uh, I think, has happened as far as emotional intelligence and an awareness of being more emotionally intelligent in this past year. I think a lot of people have put their frustrations out on social media, but it is mm -hmm. important to remember that your words are in black and white and yeah. are permanent and you have to be mindful of that. And those are real people in, in real places. And there's so much good in Syracuse that is happening. I mean, really we're in a renaissance and like, and more and more things are, are growing and developing here. And I think a lot of people from the bigger cities are moving up here because they see that. Um, and it's, yeah, again, thanks to an account like yours that helps highlight that. Yeah. I think a lot of the times, and I'm not trying to categorize an entire group of people, but a lot of the comments I hear and I see are people who used to live here decades ago, who haven't been back, who only hear about us from an article on Facebook. They have no attachment to the community anymore other than hatred. So they project these outdated opinions onto us as a community and I think we have to do a better job of stepping up and saying that's incorrect, but also how do we elevate everybody in our community so we can say that is incorrect. Those are outdated opinions about people here and places here. I mean, it's the age old thing. You can get involved and help or you shouldn't complain. Yeah, true, true, true words. Let's yeah. flip the script here and talk a little bit about Sarah's guest house. Um, you are the executive director. Tell me about your work with Sarah's guest house. What is the mission and what do you all do? Yeah, so Sarah's guest house, I started there in 2018 now. So it's been a couple of years since I've been there. Um, we are the only adult healthcare hospitality home in Central New York. Um, we serve on average about 1,100 people a year who stay at our house. Um, they, are, they are individuals who are coming to town for healthcare. Um, the easy way to think about the house is it's just like a Donald McDonald house, except for adults. Um, so it can be the patient themselves or the loved one of a patient. So an easy example is there was a woman last year who stayed with us for almost 10 months from Kenya. Um, it was her first time in the country. Her son, who is a student at Cornell, had a stroke. And so she was told that her son, you know, had a stroke. He was receiving life saving care at Upstate Hospital because that's where he was sent, yeah. you should come to the country and be with him. So she came here and it's like, where would she stay? Where would she go? She doesn't know where she is. How would she um, eat, get a drive to from the hospital? Our house takes care of all that. So we like to say that all you have to do is focus on yourself and your loved one. We provide the bedroom, the transportation to and from the hospital, um, all the meals you would need and all the comforts of home. So our staff and volunteers are on hand to assist in any way possible. Um, and that's just one story of dozens that we get almost every day because the house can sleep up to 20 people a night. Oh, wow. um, during the pandemic, we had to cut back a little bit, obviously, um, with our capacity, but it's very rewarding in the fact that 
a lot of times we are the first person that an, an individual who comes to Syracuse has contact with. And so I have this ability to also sh showcase our community in another way at my job by offering all the comforts that we do to these individuals who most of the time are coming to us during what is typically one of the worst experiences in their lives that they're going through. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, you do amazing work. Um, and this is a local nonprofit. This isn't a national nonprofit, correct? Yeah. So we don't get any state funding or federal funding. It's all community donations. Um, guests who stay with us, um, we ask for $25 a night, mm. but they don't have to pay. Mm. Historically, about half of them can pay and do pay. The other half don't. Mm -hmm. um, each year we have one big fundraiser among others, but our largest one is a gala that we hold each year that's actually coming up in just a couple of weeks. Yes. And when this um, podcast uh, episode airs, it'll have passed, but can you talk to uh, our viewers and listeners a little bit about that? How can they give to Sarah's guest house and make an impact on those individuals that um, come to Syracuse um, uh, that to, to stay while their, their loved ones are in the hospital? Yes. Yeah, so um, honestly, I would say the starting point is just to go to our website. Um, there's an option to donate your time as a volunteer. So we only have five staff members and we have about 150 active volunteers who do the cooking, the cleaning, the transportation, all the comforts again. Um, you can also donate items to the house. We're always in need of things like paper products. There's a wish list on the website. And um, then obviously funding, we're always in, in need of funding, um, which is why we hold those fundraisers and campaigns during the year. Yeah. Uh, amazing work. And that's so great to hear uh, the impact that you're having on those those individuals and families that, that need that help. Because the last thing that um, in that situation, especially for a mother who's come across the country, across the ocean to yeah. take care of her son, who's uh, very sick, you know, is to worry about a place to live and how to navigate a completely different place. Um, so amazing work. Let's talk a little bit about you specifically. Um, what drives you? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I guess just to do good. Um, I often think that, you know, we only get one life, obviously, to live, and I want to have an impact in my life. And I think I have chosen specific things that I think I can make better or improve or put my efforts into, such as the community, the stuttering world, things like that, that I feel like I can have that that my efforts yield tangible results yeah. um so i think that's what drives me the most um for my work um in different aspects of my life i've won different awards which i'm always honored by but that's not uh what drives me in effort there's always um this like almost running joke that even at an award show, I'm already thinking about like what's next and what I want to be doing because I'm always like, there's always so much to be doing. There's so much to get done, um, especially in the community work. There's always people who need help. We have so much to do um, to get us all on the right track. And I think my work on the Instagram account for example, it's just one piece of the puzzle, but all of us have to kind of take up a piece in order to move us forward. Um, 
So I think I'm always driven by the fact that there's more work to do, so let's get to it. Um, I think at times I should pause and kind of say like, all right, we did good here, let's um, to reflect on it, but I'm often the kind of person who's like, all right, what's next? Let's, let's go on to what the next project is. Um, I think th those words sort of um, resonate with me and uh, a lot of the individuals that I've interviewed on this podcast have said the same thing. You know, they're always on to the next thing and the next thing. Yeah. Um, uh, and especially I think when it comes to nonprofit or community work, um, it, the need is always ongoing with whatever, um, you know, need there is that you're focused on. Um, but it's good that we have people in our society like you, um, that want to make an impact in that way and want to leave an, a legacy and, and do good with the life that they have. Um, mm. so thank you for everything that you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, you. my next question to you is, um, with all that's going on, uh, you know, the, with Syracuse history and the positives and negatives that come from that, uh, that, you know, we hear about, um, people shaming Syracuse or whatever, or, um, the, the hard times that people go through with Sarah's guest house, but the good that you do with that, how do you keep into a, a positive mindset? Um, I don't know. I do try to give myself just a little bit of downtime each day if it's going for a walk. Um, I actually spend a lot of time in Oakwood Cemetery. Um, it's like our own little oasis in the city. And it's probably kind of morbid to think like this, but I often like look out onto the tombstones and think like, you know, anything that you're going through, um, painful in your life now or things that have passed like at some point it all comes to an end so how much worry are you going to put into it and how much stress are you going to put into it that um when you're in it it does always seem like a big deal and it certainly is and i have those moments where i'm panicking like crazy but then at the same time you kind of have to pause and think that this is just a tiny um, picture of your entire life's work um, and of all the days that you're gonna get. So I do try to put those bad things aside and look at the big picture of life. Oh, that's a good point um, and good perspective to have. Um, and I just think of all things happen for your good. So even the bad, parts of uh chapters that we all have um even though like you said in the moment it seems like it's never you're never going to go out of it eventually it does end and there's a new beginning um yeah and like with individuals who might come across um in a way that you can't understand too i think being a person who stutters um allows you to have a greater understanding of other people. Um, what's the word I'm, I'm thinking of, <laughs> Danielle? Uh, yeah, um, people who stutter are a lot more empathetic because like stuttering is almost a hidden handicap. You don't really know what that person is going through until you start speaking to them and then you might hear a gap or struggle and be like, oh, something's up here. And I wouldn't have known that. And just talking to them and getting them to talk to you could be a big milestone in their day, which for you, it's not. And so you kind of have that understanding that even the simple things can be difficult for some people. So you kind of sit back and reflect on that and think well if that's difficult for me everybody's going through something in life so what is going on in their life that is difficult for them at that moment which is why they might be coming across how they come across or maybe act a certain way or don't act a certain way that you're used to or would hope them to do um so uh, in certain ways, I think stuttering um, has its benefits in life because it's taught me a lot of different life 
lessons at a, at a young age. Yeah. Um, just to go along with what you're saying, I think, I think that's very true. I think when somebody, especially if you ha- or I have an autoimmune disease, or if you might have a mental illness, some hidden disease of some, yeah. a lot of the time, I think you develop an empathy or a, a more of a com- compassion or understanding for what other people might be yeah. going through that you don't see on the outside. Cause on the outside, they look perfectly normal, but mm-hmm. again, there's, there's, uh, everybody's uh, lives are just as detailed and um, deep as yours is. And sometimes we don't think that of other people. We just take what we see for, for what it is. Um, but, and it's the same thing with social media, not always is uh, yeah. somebody's life um, cheerful and happy as they, they promote um, on, on social media, but we all have our ups and downs and we all have things going on, but it's important to lead with a compassionate heart and an understanding of, you don't know what's going on in this person's life and, and to have that empathy. Um, and I think having that takes that person very far, um, having that understanding. So very good. Yeah. Spot on. Um, my last question for you that I end, uh, all my episodes with is how do you define success? And you may have touched a little bit on this with your answer, um, about what, you know, what, um, drives you. Um, but yeah, I would say living a life with a purpose and it's your own purpose, uh, purpose, Others can't decide for you what it is or um, the road that you're going to take to get there. I think everybody's different as we just talked about. And so my success is, I think I'm, I'm here for a purpose. And so I spend my time reaching those goals that I set, which I understand are not the goals that others might have. Um, And I don't judge others for not doing the kind of things that I do because each one of us has our own goals. But I think identifying what your purpose is and setting goals to meet that purpose is an important thing that you should do um, in this one life that we get. Oh, that's perfect. That that gave me chills. I think that's (laughs) something that I align with as well and and can, and can relate to is, um, what is your purpose and, and go after that and, and, um, in life. Well, thank you so much. Yo, go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) And honestly, like you might not be able to identify that purpose for a long time. Like some people spend their whole life, um, trying to find that purpose. So, um, I think those who have it are lucky. Well, thank you so much for having a conversation with me today and giving some insight into your story and into Syracuse history and into Sarah's guest house. These are amazing um, uh, organizations and um, uh, initiatives that you have. So everyone, please uh, connect with Syracuse history on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about Sarah's guest house, um, like David said, go to their website and you can learn more about the work that they do and how you can make an impact. Voices for Impact is on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as podcast platforms. So please follow and subscribe to stay connected. And I will see you next time on Voices for Impact.